Hey, good morning, y'all. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I was given this wonderful mom cake from all of you, and I want to thank you. I believe they told me um, this is for telling us all the things we don't want to hear. I'm like, all right, you're welcome. You know, it's really, really good. It's really, really good to be back in church this morning. You know, my hus husband, Chris, uh, the drummer, uh, and I have been in Colorado, like you said, for the past two weeks for a marriage retreat that our Grace uh, Church uh, world recommends that we do from time to time. Two weeks ago, uh, we started this message series called Better Relationships. And then last Sunday, Kip, yay, Kip, talked about, yes, go, I was watching online, talked about how better relationships forgive one another. And like I said, uh, Chris and I have been on like a marriage to retreat, so you can be sure we needed to, to hear that message and we listened to it. Uh, what do you say, Chris? Uh, did we need to hear it? <laughs> right answer. Good answer. You know, and equally important, equally important is what we're going to be talking about here in part three, and it's this, um, better communication. Better communication. Everyone wants their relationships to be better, Right? And being in relationship implies uh, that we interact with one another, right? When we're in relationship with an, well, and that interaction that we have with one another, it's called communication. It's called communication, whether it's an email or a text, um, whether it's a, a, a long conversation or a fight, whether it's uh, a dirty look or a warm embrace, uh, the quality of our communication is everything when it comes to to our relationships. So not that it's all about me, uh, but most of you all know that I'm in 12-step recovery from drugs and alcohol, so of course it's always all about me, okay? That's the way it is. All kidding aside, a lot of, a lot of the time uh, Chris and I spent this last uh, two weeks, um, we were at this Christian retreat. And, and the reason we were there was to try to come to terms uh, with a couple of decades worth of increasingly limited and superficial communication in our relationship. Let me explain. Um, the word communication actually can mean different things. Uh, for instance, communication can be just used to get the facts out there, right? Just the facts, just the facts, man. Text is good for this. You know, honey, bring me home some milk, right? That works. Email is good communication, too, but that's for, like, longer bits of factual information. Hi, Tiffany. You know, lots have been going on in my, in my family lately. Let me tell you about the job changes, and let me tell you about uh, the graduation party last week. Send, right? That's email. Uh, and then there's social media. Okay, whoa, social media. Now, social media co uh, communicates useless information or... You know, it could be important facts to let lots of people know at once uh, when it would be hard to tell folks individually whatever it is you want to tell them. For instance, um, here's a selfie of me, you know, at the beach. Or um, it saddens me to have to tell you that so-and-so has passed away. And then we can push send and lots of people know. And then factual communication can actually be real words spoken between, like, us, real, real people. Did you remember to let the dog out? Uh, I, I left the file you need on, on your desk. Um, hey, that movie last night that we watched was really good. You ought to see it. So that's one use of communication, to get the facts out there. And that's where Chris and I have been, well, frankly, stuck for a long time, not to blame anyone, uh, but gravity, here's the deal, gravity when it comes to your relationships is always downhill. Just do nothing for long enough and you'll find yourself at the bottom. And that's the truth. Let me share a word of wisdom from my husband, something we both learned, and you can take notes if you want. Uh, say it with me, it's on the screen. This is a criticism, go. Communication is more than transfer of facts. Wise man, Chris. Wise man. Because there's another use of communication. Uh, it's one that God reserves specifically for us humans. And it's the communication that binds us together as humans on the journey of life. All of us intertwined 
mind, spirit, emotions, and physical experience. It's the communication that we're made for as people lovingly created in the image of God. It's the kind of communication that goes on between God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. When our relationships suffer, it's often our struggle with this type of trusting and loving communication that takes our relationships down. It takes them out. Now, I would just bet that if you're having trouble in any relationship today, it's because of a breakdown in loving communication about the issue that you have. Perhaps you've fallen into making that other person an object like Kip talked about last week, someone to vanquish and convince rather than to listen to and understand and respect. See, loving communication is what we want to talk about today. We want to learn how to do it. We want to grow to be more like Jesus in it. So here's another great uh, Chris quote from our weekend. Look out, I'm full of them today, okay? So say it with me. It's on the screen, go. When you don't communicate well, it gets worse. Amen. Can everybody say amen? amen? I know we know it's true. So it's my prayer today that we all lean into what we hear today, me included, me included, so that the full expression of God's loving gift of relationship can flourish in every single one of us. Because here's where we're going to land today. Say it with me. It's on the screen. Better communication listens with love. It's God's will for us. And it's our birthright. So let's see what we find out as we go on today. So to start, let's go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible, uh, to a story of communication that could have gone epically wrong, but somehow ended up right. This story is in the Old Testament book of Joshua, and it's a story full of politics and family issues and intrigue, a big-scale disagreement that could have caused a war but didn't. I'd like to see Lin-Manuel Miranda take a shot at this for his next musical. After all, who thought that Hamilton would be a big deal, right? Maybe, I don't know, maybe this could, maybe this could be good, but I digress. Here we go. Book of Joshua, right? Book of Joshua. We find the 12 tribes of Israel after Moses has led them out of Egypt, and now the tribes are living in the promised land. So, when we talk about tribes, we're really talking about the families multi-generational families of 12 sons of Jewish patriarchs. And trust me, their family stories are just as twisted and hard to follow as mine is and probably yours as well, okay? Uh, open your Bible if you want to learn more about that. There's plenty in here. What we're going to care about today is that these 12 multi-generational tribes have finally made it into the promised land. So how many people is that we're talking about? Well, each tree, tribe had about 30,000 and 70,000 people, and there were 12 of them. So we're talking about a lot of people here, okay? Now, here's the deal. 9.5 of the tribes have settled on the west side of the Jordan River, and 2.5 of the tribes have settled on the east side of the Jordan. And if you wonder what the half and half split is about, we're not getting into that today, but hey, like I said, it's family, right? And family is complicated. Suffice to say, suffice to say that this geographical difference added conflict to the conflict that was already in the tribes. Trouble brewing. That's all I have to say, trouble brewing. And that's us too, by the way, when we're separated out like that, right? Isn't that us too? Last Sunday, Kip, Kip, Kip didn't shy away from the differences that we have here in our world today, right? Republican and Democrat, white, black, brown, yellow, red, rich, poor, PhDs, GEDs, blue collar, white collar, gay people, straight people. I mean, so, some of these differences are more serious than others, but remember that we're not alone in having them. Differences of belief and experience have been, has, have been straining relationships all the way back to those, these earliest stories of God's activity amongst the Israelites. So it all begins in Joshua chapter 22, where the leader of all the tribes, Joshua, gives some instructions 
before they all go into their sections of the promised land. And here's what he says. Joshua says, but be very careful to keep the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. To love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's Joshua 22, 5. Joshua basically says, Love God, obey God, keep God's commandments, hold fast to God, serve God. And if you'll do these five things, people, it'll uphold your spiritual and social order and it will see you through anything. And then Joshua blesses them all and sends them all home. Now, one of the ways that these tribes are supposed to obey God was to set up worship space only in the place where God said to. And where God said to was a worship tent called the Tabernacle in a place called Shiloh. But here's where things get sketchy. Joshua 22, 10 through 12. When they came into Geliloth near the Jordan in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar there by the Jordan. And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Geliloth near the Jordan on the Israelite side, the whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war against them. You see what happens here. These 2.5 tribes set up a worship space in a different place than Shiloh. Joshua had just told them that they needed to obey God, and it looks like they did not. And war is about to happen. Now, get real. Have you ever looked at someone and what they're doing and you just judge how wrong it was and get ready to go to war with that person, no question that asked? Have you ever heard what someone said and judged how wrong it was and get ready to go to war with that person, no questions asked? Life is a contact sport, isn't it? I've said it before. Sometimes going to war actually means lashing out with our tongue, right? Saying something. Sometimes it means lashing out with our fists. But sometimes going to war is resentment in our hearts that builds up. In a relationship, war, although someone might claim victory, nobody wins. Nobody wins. So this was true between Chris and me, that's for sure. We had different sides of many issues going into this retreat. Uh, and, and we each felt how right we were and how wrong the other person was. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> let's say it again. <laughs> we were like those 12 guys. because let's say it again. Trouble was brewing. And here it is on the screen. This is what we have to remember. Better communication listens with love. Let's see what happens with our tribes, and I'll tell you what happened with Chris and me in a minute. I can, and I can tell you with the, the, with the tribes what the spoiler alert is. Amazingly enough, even with all those people and the evidence of wrongdoing in the air, there wasn't a, a war. Spo- spoiler alert. But here's why. Joshua twenty two thirteen. So the Israelites sent Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, to the land of Gilead, to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Huh. Well, this is kind of fascinating. Why didn't the West tribes just annihilate the East tribes? Blow them away. They were the wrong ones, right? Well, they sent an emissary instead. Maybe the West were actually people of God, right? The the West aren't even the wrong ones, and, and they take the initiative to make things right. They risk. They risk. You know, in 12-step recovery, we use a certain scripture when it comes to making things right. It's this from Matthew 5, 23 and 24, the very words of Jesus. Say them with me. They're on the screen. Go. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift right? Not even, not even if you're the wrong or right one. You know, when we say that better relationships are going to require communication that listens with love, first thing we need to do is step out and bring up the issue. 
Just bring it up. And how you bring it up is really important. Let me explain. Chris and I had an incident at the Denver airport renting a car. Let's just have an incident right away, right? <laughs> now, I wanted him to, be, to pay to be an additional uh, driver so I could sightsee from the passenger seat instead of driving the whole time. Makes sense, right? Aren't I right? Yeah, yeah thank you. Chris saw what it was going to cost, and he just said a short and sweet no. And at the counter, I overrode him and told the clerk a short and sweet yes. Okay, now, so this got Chris mad, and my feelings got hurt, because I felt like he didn't care about how stressed I got while driving around in a strange place for two weeks. Well, we went the whole rest of the day without bringing it up, without bringing it up. He was mad. I was hurt. He was thinking, I'll just ignore it, and it'll go away. And I was thinking, there is no way I'm going to be the teleprompter to a conversation when our retreat guide said that he was supposed to make the first move this week for a change. <laughs> Just saying. But here's the deal. I didn't want a heart at war towards Chris. I wanted a heart at peace. So, at an ice cream parlor in Littleton, Colorado, in communication that Chris will forever remember as taking seven hours, and I assure you it was only less than 30 minutes, <laughs> I brought it up. I didn't have to bring it up, but I chose to initiate it. I asked questions. I started with questions, lots of questions about what Chris thought about what happened at the airport. And here's the deal, I cannot even stress enough the necessity of asking questions when you communicate with another person, in conflict or not. Start with questions. Don't start with a statement. Don't start with accusations about the other person. Ask questions. Now, what, what should you do? I, I've just said it to you. It's up there. Can you, can you say? <laughs> say it again. <laughs> Thank you. The 9.5 tribes on the west side sent their emissary to do just that. And here's what happened, Joshua 22, 21. Then Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh replied to the heads of the clans of Israel. So the 2.5 eastern tribes hear the questions and hear the concerns of the west. I don't want us to go too quickly past that. Because hearing and listening and caring are all different things, aren't they? See, the West could have come asking their questions just to hear what they wanted to hear so that they could ease their conscience about going to war with the East. And the Eastern tribes, after the emissaries came from the West, could have listened with ears, prepared to hear what they wanted to hear, and defend themselves so they could just go to war as well. Neither did, though. So can we just admit it that sometimes in our disagreements, in relationships, when we ask questions and then listen to the answers, don't we listen just to defend ourselves or hear the wrong things we want to hear so that we can have more ammunition in the fight? Come on, come on. Is it just me that sometimes asks questions just to listen for my own purposes, to form a battle plan, or to shoot holes rather than to really understand what the other is feeling and thinking and why they do what they do? Friends, this is not the point of asking questions and listening. The point is to really understand where the other person is coming from. In our story in the Bible, in, the, in this case, when the West listens, here's what they find out they actually discover that the motivation for the East to build the altar was not to worship there, but as a monument reminder that they were one with their neighbors, not to buck the system. Their intention was unity, not disobedience. The altar wasn't for burnt offerings or sacrifices. Everybody knows those were to be done in Shiloh. You know, seeking clarification is crucial. 
It's crucial because usually when it comes to communication, humans, here's the deal, humans tend to attribute someone else's shortcomings to a character flaw, but we give grace to ourselves and think our shortcomings are simply due to circumstances beyond our control because we have noble intentions. Here's how it played out for me at the counter of the car rental place, the Chris. I'm thinking that Chris being mad is unreasonable because he's being selfish and he's not caring that I was doing all the driving during a time of retreat. But I don't think I'm unreasonable, even though I'm actually being selfish as well, not caring that Chris doesn't want to spend a whole lot of extra money that we don't have. But what I do is honorable. What he does is mean. Nothing's wrong with my character. It's his character that's at fault. Right? Come on. You know you do it. And of course, we went all afternoon being upset with each other until the fateful ice cream parlor uh, encounter. You know, in our story in the Bible, it would have been easy for the Western tribes to assign a character defect to their Eastern cousins. They could have come into the meeting asking their questions this way. You two and a half tribes have always been a pain. You never listen. You're a rebellious, egotistical losers who can't even follow Joshua's simple instructions to obey God. So what's the stupid reason you have this time for building this altar? Instead, the Western nine and a half tribes actually ask questions and listen to understand. And we should do the same, friends. And please, 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 Ask these questions face-to-face, -face, not on Facebook or TikTok or Twitter or Instagram. Text and emails, I mean, they're good for sharing informative facts like we talked about earlier on, but nothing else. The Western tribes, they sent people, not a text message, okay, to the tribes in the East to find out what's up. Do you know that Jesus is recorded as asking 307 questions in the four Gospels in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus wanted to really know people because he really cared about people. He didn't just care about getting his own way. He loves enough to get to know people's motivations, their intentions, the reasons behind their actions, their stories. And if we want healthy relationships, friends, we would be wise to follow his example. Okay, so what happened after I initiated conversation and asked questions and tried to listen to Chris in that ice cream uh, parlor? Well, to my good husband's credit, to my good husband's credit, he didn't flinch. He got flustered, but he answered my questions honestly, and he, t and he tried his best to understand where I was coming from and haltingly uh, did his best in responding with his own observation. It wasn't an easy communication because we're really out of practice, but we're getting better. But we're getting better. You know, I once was taught, and I really do believe, that the best communication happens when you can completely and thoroughly argue the other person's point. Then you truly understand. I'm terrible at this, but I'm willing to learn because I want better relationships. And Chris and I are both at the point that we really want to be happy more than we want to win. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. I'd suggest to you that it's good wisdom that when faced with a conversation, seek to clarify what's happening. Start with questions to understand the other person and say it with me again, it's on the screen, go. Better communication listens with love. Well, we might as well go on with the story of the tribes. They didn't go to war, but here's what did happen. Joshua 22, 30 through 31. When Phineas the priest and the leaders of the community, the heads of the clans of the Israelites, heard what Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh had to say, they were pleased. And Phineas, son of Eleazar, the priest, said to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, Today we know that the Lord is with us, because you've not been unfaithful to the Lord in this matter. Now you've rescued the Israelites from the Lord's hand. Hooray! Resolution! No war! And with that, the conflict is over. They don't drag it on and on, rehashing everything ad nauseum. 
Those from the West don't double down and say, that was a close one, wasn't it? Because if you'd have done what we thought you would have done, we would have crushed you. Those from the East didn't use this as a chance to say, you know, y'all from the West always think you're better than us, but it worked out this time. Church, you know what I'm talking about, don't you, in your own relationships? You know, one of the most challenging scriptures in the Bible for me is 1 Corinthians 13, where we read that love. Real love, love that's of God, keeps no record of wrongs. It's great news for me that God keeps no record of my wrongs, but it's bad news if I want to keep score of yours. You know, and frankly, I wish that I was as good at remembering Bible scriptures as I am at remembering those who have done me wrong or even have almost done me wrong. You know, we don't see any of that. In the story of the 12 tribes, they resolved their issues, period, done. Now, here's the deal. Bottom line is we know that relationships take two. Uh, not a one of us holds all the cards when it comes to better loving communication in our relationships. Can't help what the other person does. But it is up to each and every one of us to do what we can do to make it so. Romans 12, 18 says this. It's on the screen. Read it with me. Go. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And after we listen, and after we understand, and after we communicate with love, caring about the other side as much as we care about our own, no matter what happens next with that person, maybe we can remember that conversation as being a time when Jesus showed up and gave us the power to do something miraculous and different than we did before. And it all begins with his power in our life when we invite him into our words and into our relationships. So our crazy 12 tribe spiritual ancestors helped us understand healthy communication, but their story isn't over. Because after sidestepping this possible war, Something else happens. It's amazing. Joshua 22, 32 through 33. Then Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders returned to Canaan from their meeting with the Reubenites and the Gadites and Gilead, and they reported to the Israelites. They were glad to hear the report and praise God, and they talked no more about going to war against them to devastate the country where the Reubenites and the Gadites lived. They were glad, they were glad to hear the report and they praised God as a result. They were glad and God got all the praise. What could be better? What could be better? You know, when we communicate with true love, God is glorified. And isn't that what we really want in our relationships, friend? Isn't it? I do. I want Chris and my relationship to be all about keeping God in the middle of it. And here's the deal, when I seek first to understand and when I don't see my husband as a battle to win, but a child of God with beautiful complexities and strengths and weaknesses and struggles and dreams, traumas and successes just like I have, I can affirm what I want you to remember and say with me again this morning, church, it's on the screen, go. Better communication listens with love. The last verse of Joshua chapter 22 says this. Read it with me. Ready? Go. It is on the screen. Go. And the Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar this name, a witness between us that the Lord is God. Think about how you communicate, friends. Just think about it. There are many things that go into the why and the how of what you do and why you do what you do, how you say what you say your history, your culture, your personal experiences, your biases, so much more. To be a witness in your relationship that the Lord is God through your loving communication, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to take awareness. And it's going to take practice. Chris and I are willing to take the time and make the effort to be more aware and to practice, practice, practice. In fact, the rest of the retreat went much smoother, with less barriers to understanding. Now, I know this. Granted, it is much easier to understand someone you love than someone who might be an enemy. Much easier when you have a kind feeling towards someone than 
than when you don't. But friends, what hurt is there to try? What hurt is there to try? Jesus is on our side. He's cheering us on because he's love. It's why he came. So, so what about if in a culture that talks over one another, in a world that doesn't know how to speak civilly to each other, in a world that wants to win more than they want to love, what if we can be a different kind of people? People of Christ, Christians, witnesses to God's love. You know, as the band comes back up, let me close with this. St. Francis was born in an Italian village of Assisi in 1182 and grew up to be a, in, a, in a ministry of poverty and service to others. Many, many followed his Christ-like life. St. Francis was a peacemaker. And we want our communication to bring peace. Here's my last Chris quote, I promise. It's on the screen. Say it with me. Peace comes through real communication. Amen. And better than even a Chris quote, let's all pray together the prayer of St. Francis, a prayer for better communication. We use it a lot in 12-step recovery. It's on a card that you were handed when you came in so that you can take it home. Can you stand together with me as we pray? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. The altar is open to spend a little time communicating with Jesus, who's there to listen and answer you with love. If you want someone to pray with you, just raise your hand.